Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everybody. And open the floor there this morning in that first session just to give some warning shots um, to beware of what's being taught out there. And um, hopefully you'll take it that way and don't think we were just trying to be mean, but we were trying to be um, helpers of your joy, right? Um, so this morning, you know, we, the last couple of weeks, we spent over in uh, Romans 5 and Romans 8. So I don't know if I've done this before here. Maybe we did it in one of the sessions, but I wanted to do it this morning because a lot of what we're talking about, it comes down to really the Word of God, the Word of God rightly divided, the premise of grace, the premise of the law, how it all comes together, and it's still about God's righteousness, right? It's about God's righteousness in the earth, and it's about God's righteousness in heaven. And both of those spears and both of those uh, agencies are going to be under the headship of Jesus Christ in the fullness of times, right? We understand that according to the book of Ephesians in chapter 1. We understand that in Colossians in chapter 1. We have learned something about the mystery of God's will. Something that God had held back and kept a secret, delivered it unto Paul. And Paul was the one who administered this out to the body of Christ. He wrote the books of Romans to Philemon. And in those books, he lays out what it is that God is doing with the body of Christ, which was not a body until he gave it to Paul. He, he, Paul was saved by God's exceeding abundant grace. And then he began to give Paul an abundance of revelation concerning this time in which we live, which is the dispensation of the grace of God. And might I say, without being ugly about it, if you do not ever understand the difference that God was doing in time past under the law with a nation, Israel, and what God is doing today without the law, in the dispensation of the grace of God, you're not going to understand your Bible, right? That's why people will call you when you have taught these things and go, wow, where has this been? And to quote one brother, he said a man came to him after he had taught it one day and says, why isn't my pastor teaching this? He said, you'd have to go ask your pastor, right? So our goal is to show you. So what I thought I would do with the book of Romans here this morning, the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, I believe, and some say not, but I believe they're very, very needed in their understanding for your foundation, right? For you to be established, as it says in Romans 16, 25. So what I want to do, I want to walk you up through the eight chapters. So then you would have maybe what we would call a skeleton. Okay, then you can go back through those books and put the meat on that skeleton as you do your studies. So my overall goal is to try to help you to understand foundationally something about the book of Romans and how it works. With the book of Romans, and especially the first three chapters, is where religion will go, denominations will go, to put you in bondage. Because they do not understand what Paul is describing in the first three chapters. Okay? This is where you become a spiritual Jew. This is where you got to have the law. This is how you become a Jew inwardly and not one out. And this is not at all what Paul is showing. And I'm going to try to help you see what Paul is showing through the first eight chapters of Romans. So I'm going to do that with a segment out of each chapter. So let's go to chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll read and then we'll, we'll pray and um, we'll go into the, our, our teaching here. In verse 14 of chapter 1, Paul said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are, that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for this day, another day of your grace and mercy and long suffering toward all men. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory for the one who went to the cross, shed his blood, died for our sins, buried with our sin, raised without our sin, and taken the glory to the right hand of power. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And everyone said, Amen. So, what I want to, uh, I don't necessarily know what the title is going to be, but I want the the theme to be this kind of I want you to understand in chapters 1 through 8 no righteousness is kind of what we're, we're going to lean to right so chapter 1 of Romans if you wanted to make a note so that you can study what Paul is really showing Paul is showing in chapter 1 that there's no righteousness in a God rejecting world Right? Paul said that they were holding back the truth, basically. They were holding the truth and unrighteousness there. Right? He said that God had revealed his wrath from heaven. Where did God reveal that wrath from heaven? He revealed that wrath from heaven right here on the cross of Christ when he put the sin of the world upon Christ. When he made Christ to become sin for us, that we might be made what? The righteousness of Christ. You understand? So if, if someone is not in faith of what Christ did on the cross, do they have God's righteousness? The answer is no. The world out here trying to teach a man-developed righteousness, what we can conjure up out of our flesh, the world system, the religious system, the satanic system that Satan has developed, that you can come to Jesus some other way than believing that how he died for your sins, shed his blood, was buried, and rose again, that is not God's plan. God has one plan for salvation today, and it is in the finished cross work of Jesus Christ all entailed in what Christ did for us. That's where God showed his wrath against sin was upon his own son. That doesn't make God a monster. God had preordained before the world was this work of the cross right here. Right? So in chapter 1 when you read that, understand that Paul is not, he, he's not condemning you to hell by any verse. What he's showing you is that the world is already under condemnation. Because of unbelief, right? So there's no righteousness in the world. Look at chapter 2 and look at verse 1. Therefore thou art an excusable old man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another. Thou condemneth, see that? Condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doth the same things. So in chapter 2, there's no righteousness in men. Right? When we take and we want to take the law, we want to take something that we feel like we're better at, and we want to judge others against that, what we do, we condemn ourselves because we're doing likewise. James said, he that offends in one point of the law has offended in how much? All of the law. So if I say to Willie, you steal and you can't be my friend, and Willie, you're going to hell because you steal, and yet I commit adultery, should I be pointing my finger at him for stealing? So what Paul is saying is man is inexcusable because all men, listen, there is a sin and there is sins, right? Guess what we are? Sinners. Why are we sinners? We've talked about it many times. Because of sin. Sin, singular, 
is the problem. Sins is what sinners produce. But we didn't produce it. What produced it? Sin in us. You see how you get it? Right? I mean, I live in a subdivision, folks, and it freaks me out in the mornings. I hear a rooster crow. A rooster crow. I'm like, where am I at? I'm not on a farm. There's a rooster out here. Now, the more he crows and the older I get, I understand why he's yelling at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right? I'm about to crow myself now when I get up in the morning and start yelling. Here's the thing. That rooster crows because he's a rooster. Amen? You might sound like him, but you're not a rooster. A sinner sins because he's a sinner and he has sin in him. So here in chapter 2, when you're reading that, don't read into all this stuff these people want to paint you into, all this stuff. You, he is saying all men. There is no man that is righteous on his own. That's right. right? Is what Paul is telling. Now go to chapter 3. Uh, like I said, to hit all eight of these, just to give you a skeleton, I need a, I, I can't just hunker down in chapter 2 and stay there for 30 minutes. All right, in chapter 3. We saw there's no righteousness in the world. Let me put those on the board. There's no righteousness in the world. There's no righteousness in man. Now when I say no righteousness in the world, I don't mean there's no saints in the world. What I mean, the worldly system that Satan has set up, there's no righteousness in it. Righteousness is imputed. So if you haven't trusted Christ and his finished cross work, you don't have the righteousness of God. Right? So there's no righteousness of man. It's not something that we can conjure up, we can work up, we can do good, Cain. Right? The mind of Cain. That's what religion is, is the mind of Cain. God said, this is what I require. Cain says, I'll do Frank Sinatra and do it my way. Right? Won't work. So now, here in chapter 3, so this is chapter 1. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3, Paul teaches us something. And, and let me say this. Chapters 1, chapters 2, and most of chapter 3, Paul is dealing with condemnation. He's dealing with condemnation of man rejecting God, man turning from God, man building his own God. They're still doing that today, folks. If you've got a God that says, he'll never let me get sick, he'll always keep me rich, he'll have me walking on top of the water, you've built yourself a God. You made him up in your head. You bought something that God said nothing to you about, right? So, in chapter 3, there's no righteousness by the law. Alright? There's no righteousness by the law. Now, if you'll get these principles down, when you go back and you study the book of Romans, it's going to help you understand doctrinally what the book is really teaching you. I think it's imperative that you do so, because this is where you're going to get established as you go on through the deeper books of Paul, right? So look here in chapter 3. Look at verse 9. What then are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all, where at now? Understand. So Paul is laying the groundwork here. If you go back and you read chapter 1, Paul comes in with the introduction of Romans. He works himself down to chapter, uh, verse 14 of chapter 1. And he begins to talk about how he's a debtor, how he is now ready. To preach the gospel. Well, the gospel is what? It's good news. But when you leave verse 16, it begins a negative overtone. A negative overtone about mankind. See, the Bible is not this book that these people on TBN found that talks about how good you and I are. About having our best life now. About how we're going to have victory in all these things. And you're going to get the best job. And you're going to rule over this. And you're going to rule over that. That's not what the Bible is telling you. What Paul is doing in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he's telling you what man is not. And he's telling you what man, what man cannot be. And it all deals with God's righteousness. Right? And it all deals with the lack of righteousness that man is without. And he shows you why. And he shows you a picture of condemnation, not just on one part, but all parts. Right? So now you, you know something now about chapters 1, 2, and 3, what Paul's laying out. Paul is looking back 
to the Jew, but he's also looking back before there was a nation of Jews. Man fell, right? And man did not go back into the kingdom of God, which was the garden back over there. God made sure of it. And sin entered through that. And so what? Death passed up on how many? All men. So look here in 310. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Do you know what that verse is saying? If God Almighty was not connected and somehow to the world, not mean, listen to what I'm saying, that he just pulled out all together and said, hey, my spirit's not there, my word's not there, I don't nothing to do with any of you folks. God did set the Gentile side, didn't he? he? He also set Israel side. But if God Almighty said, my spirit's out, my word's out, I'm not going to have a teacher, I'm not going to have a preacher, my spirit's not going to deal with you. You know what that Bible's saying? When you're turned off to yourself, you will not seek after God. If God was not putting the word out through people, and the spirit of God was not dealing with man through God's word, none of us, none of us, none of us would come to God on our own. Not one of us. You know, I hear people say, I found God. Thanks be unto God, He found me. Right? He found me with the Spirit of God and with the Word of God. He found me. Was Paul seeking God? Paul was destroying people because they believed that Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah. And he said, no, he's an imposter and I'll kill anybody that looks like him. But God's grace found Paul. You see that? God's grace found you. Look here in 12. They are all gone out of the way. You know what people have a problem with that verse? My mama, my daddy, my grandma, my grandpa. My children, my grandchildren. Don't you tell me they're no good. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Right? They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. How many of them? No, not one. Now Paul comes to a conclusion. Because in one and in two, he says you, he shows you there's no righteousness in the world system. There's no they denied God when they knew him, did not retain him in their knowledge, and because of that, they did whatever their imagination said do, they did. In chapter two, he said all men are inexcusable. You got no excuse. In chapter three, he said there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good, then none seeketh after God. Right? So then Paul now can come to 320 and he can declare something that he's wanting to show you the reason he laid out that condemnation in 1 and 2. Look at 320. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There you go. Law abiders. Yeah. Yeah. Let me keep the Sabbath. Let me abstain from pork. Yep. All the stuff you want to do, Paul said, you can't get justified that way if you tried. Yep. Even if you could do it, yep. which God says you can't do it, but even if you could, he's not accepting it. Look here at 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and what? The prophet. So Paul just declared in 320 that there, by the law there's no righteousness. He showed you in 21 where the righteousness is at. Where is the righteousness of God at? It's wrapped up in His Son, Jesus Christ, who did all the work for us, right? Yeah. Now go to chapter 4. In chapter 4, Paul's going to show you there's no righteousness by our works. Chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh have found? Everybody remember the answer to that? Absolutely nothing. According to his flesh he found nothing. Right? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had were of the glory. But not before God. Listen folks. If you could take the world system... And if man had some righteousness in him and he could accomplish it by the law, you know what that man could do and would do? He would boast about it. 
That's what the ones in religion are doing right now. I don't do this. I don't do that. I do this. I do that. I, 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 I. Isaiah 14. The five eyes of Satan. Right? And that's what they do. They get propped up on what they can generate, what they're doing, and they judge others by. And in doing so, they condemn themselves. Right? Right? Are, are, you, are you seeing a little bit about how this book should work for you when you're dealing with Romans? Take chapters 1, 2, and 3 and look at them to how the condemnation of mankind came about, right? It came about by the fall of Adam and him passing on sin to all men and death by all, right? On all. You see that? That's really what one and two are about. And it's what three are about. Now Paul's going to paint a picture starting here in chapter four going forward that you and I ought to be standing on top of these tables doing a Snoopy dance. Right? Look here in four. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. See that? You see the word counted? You see it? Counted. You know what the word impute means? To count. Right? To account it. It's an accounting word. Impute. It means to charge to someone's account. So, Abraham did what? He believed God. And God did what? He counted it. He imputed it to Abraham for righteousness. He didn't make Abraham righteous in the flesh. He accounted his righteousness to Abraham. Right? That's a big disconnect. Because a lot of people think that when you got saved, God took your want to away. Your want to amplified. You know how I know that? Because the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. Some people have no problem doing whatever they want to do. You know why? Because they've never really had the Spirit. Amen? And I'm not telling you there's some saved people that don't do some bad things. I know they do. But what I'm telling you is a lot of people, they have no feeling toward it at all because they've never had the Spirit. They're still operating from the flesh completely. All right? So now look here in four. 4-4. Four, four. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness. See that? Now look over in 4. He's talking about how Abraham, 421, he's talking about how Abraham, being fully persuaded, what he had promised, he was able to perform. I was just having a conversation with uh, the folks here earlier, before we started. When Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you know why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel? Because he knew that gospel right there had the ability to do all that God said it would do. So he wouldn't have to come back tomorrow and say, hold on guys, I forgot a little something. Yes, you are going to need Jesus dying on a cross and shedding his blood and raised again. But you're also going to have some good works to go with that. No, 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 no. Paul wasn't ashamed that by grace through faith are we saved. He wasn't ashamed that this cross had the power to do all that God said it would do. He had no shame in that. He knew what it would accomplish, right? He, amen. I, I, I use the analogy. If I said I've got the only deodorant in the world that to keep you from stinking, you're probably going to go, well, let me try it some, right? But at 12 o'clock today, you started smelling yourself. You'd say, hey, man, you ought to be ashamed of that deodorant because it didn't do what you told me it would do. Paul didn't have to worry about that. That cross will do everything that God said it would do. You know all you can do with it? Believe it, Abraham. And when you believe it, God puts that righteousness to your account. Amen. This is what Romans is teaching. This is the foundational part of Romans. One, two, three. Condemnation. Want to live by law? You're condemned yourself. You're, you're inexcusable. You've, you've had enough word given to you here. Whether or not you took it or not, you'll never ever stand before God and say, I never heard that. Right? Back here, this world had rejected God, did not retain him in their knowledge. The things that they knew of God, they could have told all men about creation and who created it. 
No, they started to worship in what? The creature. Right. And they got away from the creator. What are we doing today in 2024? Yeah. We're worshiping the creature and we've gotten away from the creator. Toby Keith that just passed away said he was riding down the road to Texas and said this guy that was part of his band, he said to him he was agnostic. He didn't believe there was a God. He said, you don't believe there's a creator? He said, no, Mr. Keith, I don't believe that there's a creator God. He said, why not? He said, I never, he's never shown himself to me. He said, but you believe in UFOs? He said, yeah. He says, when's the last one of them you've seen? <laughs> That's what people's done with God. Yeah. There ain't no God because he's never shown himself to me. Let me say this. You're not on fire this morning. He's shown himself to you. You're not in hell screaming this morning. He's made himself real to you. Right? You, yeah, you got up this morning. You're breathing. You're walking. He's shown himself to you. Amen. Well, I do that on my own. Sure you did. You'll find out one day. You'll find out one day what you can do on your own. Now go to chapter 5. Chapter 5, <laughs> my chapter, love this chapter. If you don't know this chapter, man, you need to study it until you get blue in the face, right? There's no righteousness outside of Christ. None. Oprah, none. Amen. Joel, none. Oh, I believe there's many ways to God. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah. Well, we'll see how far your money goes when you stand before him. Depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Look here in chapter 5. Look at 12. Wherefore, as by one man centered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon how many men? And why? And why? And why? And you keep repeating it. There ain't one. Now, you know what that means? My mama, my daddy, my grandma, my grandpa. You can paint the picture all the way back to Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't know how good they were. I know how good they were according to the flesh. Yeah. Now, they might have been some good people, morally good, according to you. Yeah. And they might have been saved. Praise be unto God. The only good in them was Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm sorry. If that upsets the apple cart or the family tree, hey, I get it. I get it. Outside of Christ, there's no righteousness. So watch this. When you're looking at chapter 5, look at verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men. What came upon all men? Judgment. Was it judgment? judgment? What does he mean by that? Condemnation. God declared that all men were unrighteous. God declared that man could not be righteous. God declared in Isaiah that all the righteousness was what? That's filthy rags. But now watch what the last Adam was able to accomplish. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That doesn't mean all men are justified. It means it's here all who believe can be justified. Amen? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Verse 18, don't change. If you don't believe God, you won't be justified. <coughs> right? Are you all with me so far? Yeah. So where is that justification? It's a free gift upon all. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall be, many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that uh, the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I'm going to stop right there. I'm, the Arminians don't have a chance. Watch this. If what Adam did by care, watch close, folks, could ever supersede what Jesus Christ did right there, you don't have a chance. If that sin back here can overthrow what Christ did on the cross, we don't have a Savior. Well, it requires my obedience. Read it again. Read it again. Somebody read it. For as but one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of how many? Why? Well, right, they'll be made what? So who was the one that was obedient? The faith of Christ, right? That sin right there, when you're put into the body, can never trump and go over what Christ did on the cross. 
Sin will not prevail over grace ever. Grace will always prevail over sin. That's how you're sealed and seated until the day of redemption, right? You know what? Y'all act like Jesus Christ when he saved you. He saved a marvel, man. You're missing one, two, and three of Romans. Did y'all not read it? When he, back in five, he, you weren't some gold piece in your flesh. And God said, I've got to have that Donnie boy. He's so pretty. He's so God almighty. If I can get me a bald-headed guy like that, I, woo, I'll be in business. That's not what God did. God's grace reached down to the worst of the worst of the worst of us, ungodly enemies, sinners, and said, here, I have done something for you that if you'll believe me, I can save you through all eternity. Amen. Amen. That's what God's grace did. And you know what? The sin in my flesh can never outdo the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are y'all with me? I'm not teaching you to go out and rob a bank. No. Right? But if you did, you'll get to spend some time in prison. <laughs> and you'll get to study your Bible. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Y'all with me? Yeah. Well, you'll go to heaven when you die. You'll be in stripes. <laughs> Look in chapter 6. I've got to move along because I've got to get the last ones here. There's no righteousness in your old man. Right? No righteousness in your old man. Uh, Y'all think if you take this home, you might be able to get some understanding about the book of Romans. Right? No righteousness of this world system. No righteousness in man. No righteousness by the law. No righteousness by our works. No righteousness outside of Christ. And here we are now, and this is what many who say they're saved want to do. They want to go back and get that old man and freshen him up. Yep. They want to transform that flesh. Watch here in 6. Know ye not that so many, verse 3, of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into what? His death. You've been identified with Christ. You know where at? Right here. Sinner. Right? Right there is your identification. Watch. Therefore we are buried with him. Woo. So when Christ was buried, well, guess what? You're buried. He didn't leave you there though, did he? As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk what? In newness of life. Because He raised you up. And not only did He raise you up, He's given you some knowledge now to walk by. Right? So now watch verse 5. For if we've been planted together in His likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. There's coming a time that Paul was desiring that, that he would be able to live, and he'd be able to walk exactly like if Paul had already been raised from the dead. That was his desire. He knew he couldn't attain to that, right? Because Paul understood that corruption could not take on incorruption. It had to die first. Right? Are you with me? All right. This, this, this position over here that we touched, go back and look at 1 Corinthians. This is one of the things I didn't bring up in the earlier session today, but I want to show you something else that they're teaching. And I don't want to hang up there long because I've got to get this done. In 15, I want you to look back at 21. And this is going to connect to this one here, and I didn't show you. Look at 15 and 21. For since by man came death. See that? By man came also the resurrection of the dead. See that? So by Adam, but the Bible is clear that death passed up on all. Right? He said, but by Christ, but there's a qualifier for it. Look in 22. For as in Adam, all do what? Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. You know why that doesn't say in the body of Christ? No, because you have to be in Christ. And it doesn't matter if it was prophetic or if it was mystery. All in Christ will be made alive at some point, right? Well, we understand something now. There's no righteousness outside of Christ. What Romans is showing you. It's a doctrinal book and it really deals with the righteousness of God. You need to get a hold of that, right? So back here to the old man in 6. And we're going to be finishing up here in two more. Look in verse 6. 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. For he that is dead to sin is freed from sin. So that old man has been crucified, and the Bible says he's been raised again, that he might walk in the newness of life. Go look at 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. Here is the foul that most people commit that call themselves Christians. Remember a while back here in one of the early teachings, off camera we talked about what is a Christian. Yeah. Remember that? And we determined that a Christian is not a person that does something or don't do something. He's a person that believes something. He's a person that does what Abraham did. He believes God. He believes the testimony that God gave about his son, how he died for our sins according to the scriptures, how he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We believe that the testimony of God concerned his son. And watch here in 2, or 2 Corinthians 5 and 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man how? After the flesh. After the flesh. Yea, though have known Christ out of flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. So, knowing people after the flesh is mainly what people do to tell you if you're a Christian or not. A Christian wouldn't do that. Well, I cheated on my taxes and you didn't know it, so you couldn't judge me, right? That goes back, you're an excusable old man. Right? Yep. See, you might look on the outward side of a man, what he does outwardly, and condemn him for it, but internally, I'll guarantee you, there's something in you just as rotten. Right. Right. We got proof of that in Romans 7. Yeah. Right? So, let, let, me, let me move on here. Move on to number 7 now. Chapter 7. And then we'll put a capstone on this here momentarily and be done. All right? You deal with this one, there's no righteousness in our flesh. That's the hardest one for people to get out of. Look at verse 18, chapter 7. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which I... Which is good, I find not. Now Paul's not saying there's nothing that's good in him because he has the Spirit of God. That's a good thing, right? He's a new man. He knows that. What he is saying is out of Paul, this dead flesh, this sinful flesh, there's nothing good in that. Right? So there's no righteousness in our flesh. All right? Jump over to 8. This chapter 8 is loaded, so we're only going to be able to stay there just for a minute. Now, we've been in 8, and, and uh, I'll, I'll put a capstone on it by going over 8 as we close. So, look in 8 in chapter 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no righteousness, folks, without the Spirit. If there's no righteousness in this world system religion, if there's no righteousness in man, if there's no righteousness by the law, if there's no righteousness by our works, if there's no righteousness outside of Christ, if there's no righteousness in our old identity, if there's no righteousness in our flesh, there's only one place can be left. There's no righteousness outside the Spirit, and it's all generated by the Spirit. See it? Boy, you might be able to study some Romans. You might be able to study some Romans now. Look here in 8 and 2. For the law of the Spirit of, of life in Christ... And Romans 8 deals with life and death. And he's dealing with spiritual life and spiritual death, right? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ have made me free from the law of sin and death. See that? 
For what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Donnie, you've read that to me so many times. Why in the world you keep rehashing it? Look at the board. Every bit of that is in that verse. You want to read it again? Watch verse 3. For what the law could not do, you can't be justified by the law. See it? In that it was weak through the flesh. You can't get it through the flesh. That's man. That's man generating righteousness. Cain, you can't do it. God sent his own son. See that? In the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. What is the Spirit teaching you? The only answer for sin is God sending his only son there in the likeness of sinful flesh to do away with it. There's no righteousness in anything outside of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Spirit's trying to teach you. That's what the Spirit's trying to show you. If any man stands up and gives you something you can do to become righteous and holy and just before God, turn him off. Because he's not in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not teaching you that. Amen? All right. So let's look at chapter 8 just for a minute in closing. In chapter, that's 41 minutes, man. I ain't doing bad at all. I'm up here beating myself up, think I'm running on an hour. 41 minutes. And every one of y'all sitting there on the edge, you want to run out here and get your chicken wings and go watch a stinking football game. <laughs> and I'm trying to get some word into you. All right. All right. I've already got my chicken wings. <laughs> I just don't sound sanctimonious. Chapter 8, I want you to look at verse 1. There's no condemnation. See that? Yeah. See it? Yeah. Why? Because we're not in the flesh. Look over here in verse 7. Because the call of mind is empty against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Right? You know where that man's still at? He's still in Adam. He's still in rotten flesh, spiritually speaking, and he cannot please God. There's not one thing he can do to please God. That's a carnal mind to sit and think, I can jump over the cross of Christ. I can go to God the Father by some way other than what God has prescribed. Can't be done, folks. It can, that's why it's called grace. It's a free gift. Right? Now watch. Paul goes on. He tells you about the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That means that we can be quickened and we can be motivated and we can be sent out by the spirit of God to accomplish something for God and do in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Reconcil reconciliation, right? We can do that ministry. Now, when you, go, when you leave 8 right there, you're going to go a little bit further. Well, not leave 8, but you're going to go on up to verses 15, 16, where we've been living the last two weeks. And Paul's showing the believer that he is under some persecutions. He is under some groanings. He is under some, some infirmities. He's under some suffering. And it's going to be that way to wit, to when God redeems this body and he fashions us a body like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you've got your saved. You've got this vessel of clay and you've got a treasure inside that vessel it is the spirit of God it's the grace of God it's the knowledge of Christ it's the wisdom of Christ it's the faith of Christ it's the gospel of Christ it's the righteousness of Christ in this vessel that vessel is motivated by the spirit to do what God would have it to do for his purpose right but in that vessel you also have sin and because of that you suffer Right? You suffer. You get sick. You have problems. You have ailments. But God, in, in, in Romans chapter 8, shows us of a hope. And the hope is the redemption of the body. Right? Then he goes on to give you a capstone. There's no condemnation. You have the Spirit right now. If you don't, you're not His. Right? You're going to suffer while you're in this body. And then he leads you up and he shows you something about how you can never be separated. Right? Go down and look. Verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God could be for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, we know there's a lot of people against us, right? Yeah. 
but they really can't be against us because they might kill the flesh. They might destroy something of your flesh. They might even destroy your credibility. They might destroy your reputation. They can do all those things, but they can't destroy what God has put in you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that does what? It's God that justifies. When you're running your mouth about me, you know what you're doing? You run your mouth about somebody who God's already justified. <laughs> right? Hey, man, you can... Have at it. If you find four things, I'll show you four more. They're wrong. I guarantee you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen. Who's Donnie trusting? Christ. Right? Who is even at the right hand of God who make up intercession for us? Now watch. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, Paul dealt with them, you deal with them. Should distress, you deal with it, Paul dealt with it. Persecutions, you might. Paul did. Famine. Paul was hungry. He was naked. He went through the, the wilderness there. Shipwreck or nakedness or peril or sword. I believe the sword really comes down to life and death. I really believe when Paul's talking about the sword there, he's talking about man taking your physical life. But that won't separate you. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And Paul's really looking at the life of the apostles when he gives those verses. But it applies to you in the fact that, watch this. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What haven't you conquered? What haven't you conquered? If you believe this, you've been saved. You've been risen. You've been seated. You've been sealed until the day of redemption. What haven't you accomplished? Yeah. You've conquered it all. Not in the flesh, but by the Spirit. Yeah. Right? And closing this morning, I want to hit it. 38. For I am persuaded that neither death. Right? That's the one everybody's afraid of. Yeah. You know why? You've never done it. Right? 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 You may not necessarily be afraid of where you're going. You may have that nailed down, and I hope you do. That's salvation. But it may just be, hey, is Leonard going to hit me in the head with a shovel like he did yesterday? Or is it going to be by fire? Or is it going to be by drowning? Is it going to be some other? You don't know how you're leaving, right? And so everybody has a question about death. Look, folks, that's just natural. But there's a place of peace that says, if I go or if I stay, I'm a winner either way. Nor life, nor angels. So all those fallen yard birds out of heaven, the angels, they can't take nothing from you. You've got it all, right? Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Notice how it ends. Where is the love of God? It's in Christ Jesus our Lord. I showed you all that to show you this. Paul starts out Romans by a condemned world, by man not having an excuse. And he paints the picture forward as you gradually go through those chapters to how we have no condemnation. We have the Spirit of God. We're not looking to our flesh and we're not a debtor to our flesh and there's nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's better than any Super Bowl. Yep. All right, let us pray. Father, we're so grateful, so thankful for the Word of God, right and the divided, so thankful for your Spirit and what your Word has shown us. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And if there be one out there today that's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, we hope the day that they would believe how that He died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for their justification. All they have to do is believe it and trust Him and Him alone. In Christ's name we pray. One said, Amen.